All right, guys, welcome to Power of Brush Root, Brush Work, Rocks and Water, it's Class One, Part Two. We're going to very quickly just cover um, Padlet. If you guys have, especially for the newer students, have any questions about Padlet? Uh, let me know, but I just want to give you guys a quick walkthrough of Padlet. It is our online classroom space. I'm going to go ahead and uh, spotlight myself. So hopefully I take up your screen and I am the focus. And then I'm going to jump over to share screen and we're going to hopefully everybody sees our Padlet page here. Yep, Great. I see some nodding heads there. Whenever I jump away from, um, whenever I'm doing a share screen, I only get to see a small number of you. So uh, just so you know, um, if you're raising your hand or anything else, I most likely don't see you. So feel free to speak up. Um, in these classes, I ask that you mute yourself if you are not, you know, being a part of the conversation just in case you have a barking dog or whatever else in the background, uh, phone calls, <clears throat> anything like that. If you have a quick question or a quick comment or uh, you know, just want to heckle really quickly, just push the space bar and hold it down while you talk. Otherwise, you're more than welcome. I like having conversations during uh, the class time and I, um, I welcome that. But just if you're not a part of the conversation, uh, just push mute, and that just helps for everybody. All right, so everybody sees our Padlet page. A quick nod from, I can see Sharon, Linda, and Cheryl. You guys are my uh, resource to letting letting me know that I'm being understood. Okay, um, so on the left here, class recordings, that's where I will share uh, the video uploads. So if you ever need to uh, look back and uh, see, in fact, here's a short one that I did as a bonus video for the last class. I wasn't able to answer all the questions that were asked. So uh, during a Thursday session, I just did, a, I think it's about 35, 40 minutes long. Uh, uh, just a quick demo um, answering some questions. Otherwise, uh, like I said, I've left all these videos up from previous classes. So if you're just like, man, six hours, seven hours of mic is not enough. I want 37, maybe 137 hours of, <laughs> of painting time. Uh, they're here for you. Um, I'll have to start deleting these soon because Padlet is getting weighted down and is getting slower to operate. Um, so just so you know, so if you're really curious, maybe start at the end and I will um, probably start deleting that way. A lot of these are on YouTube, just so you know. Um, but uh, I was going to delete them in between this and the last class, but was asked not to quite yet. Um, so anyway, so I will post them here. I will also email everybody the links. And you're more than welcome to keep those. Like I said, a lot of the videos are going to be set to private. So if you weren't looking for them on YouTube, you will not find them. You need the link to get to them. That made sense to everybody? Online links. This is our area. Just you guys are more than welcome to share. If you find a YouTube video that you find really interesting or a song that you're like, man, I could play this song on repeat all day long. It's so beautiful to paint to. Um, I actually used to have a bunch of music on here that I paint to, um, but I've deleted it again. I'm just trying to clear out space on this Padlet page. It has gotten pretty big, um, and I will probably start deleting some of these, um, these videos as well in the next couple of weeks, or if our Padlet page becomes too slow and hard to operate. So anyways, that's your place to share any kind of online links, videos, uh, music, anything that you'd like to share with the community. Class handouts. Um, this is where I will send you the email with the relevant handout for the week, which was for this week, it's tactile perspective and the palette knife. And um, when Hassan and I were talking before he signed up for the class, I made a joke that you could probably, uh, if you printed all these up, you'd probably have a book 
of all the handouts. Um, I know it's not a good business plan <laughs> that I just share everything all the time, but I, I like it. <laughs> I just don't mind doing it. And um, if any of these things are useful to you as you're going forward, you know, feel free to print them up, feel free to read them, whatever it is. Um, for about four out of these seven classes, you will probably receive a new handout, which means that's a lot of time on my part, especially as a dyslexic um, non-writer. I spend a lot of time uh, researching. Some of these are up to about four or five pages long. Um, so uh, just, yeah, hopefully they're useful. They're useful for me to just go back and put into words what I've learned over all these years, both through trial and error. And um, anyway, so hopefully you guys find the handouts useful. I think the one that I just gave you was about two or three pages long. Um, yeah, it's pretty good size. Um, so anyways, that is there. Reference photos. So for any of you who are, you know, good photographers or uh, have really fun photos that you might want to paint from and you're willing to share with the rest of the class, thinking that maybe somebody else in your uh, in this group would want to paint from it. This is a great place to share that I have just like in all the other sections. So, so many. The uh, photos that I've taken over the years and, uh, you know, have either made of paintings from or hope to make paintings from um, views from our cabin, uh, my sister's ranch in Montana, uh, a place I'll be teaching a plein air workshop at the end of August for anybody who's interested. Um, anyways, just tons and tons and tons of photos. You guys are more than welcome to paint from any of these. Um, you know, this one would have probably been better for the trees and sky, not maybe so much for rocks and water, but, uh, you know, you are welcome to, um, use, abuse, change, whatever you want to do with these photos. Um, a lot of these pertain to past classes, um, and a great way to share stuff with you. This is a photo that I saw on Facebook of the Garden of the Gods, which uh, I think a couple people in the class live somewhat close to. This is a new friend of mine on Facebook. And um, I actually don't even know if it's a guy or a, a woman because the name of the, uh, that they always post is ER Photos, which I don't even know what that means. But they take these great photos. I asked if I could share this with you because it's about rocks and about values, lights and darks about you know creating some of that. So I just thought I'd share that. This is the photo that I wanna talk about a little bit today as a, how would I edit this? What would I do differently? And um, <clears throat> this is the painting that I actually kind of wanna work on today. I know it's not that interesting. These rocks are all just black, probably volcanic, um, the surf, but it's gonna be based on, if we jump over to my section, a plain air painting I did while I was visiting Spain. Um, this is a, a painting I did six, seven years ago. It's the only full palette knife painting I've ever done. Um, and when I got back, I instantly sold it and instantly regretted it. And it's the only time this has ever happened in my life that I literally called the person who bought the painting and said, if you come back to my studio with that painting, I will give you any painting in my studio and trade. So they paid, I don't know, $500, $600 for this nine by 12. And they walked out with a $2,000, $3,000 painting. Um, smart, good business on their part, but I have not regretted it. This I don't keep very many of my paintings, but this was such a fun and beautiful uh, morning and again, because it was palette, oh, where do I want to go here? Because it was palette knife and oils, I was actually, you can see how wet the cement is around me. I was getting soaked and it was actually, this is, I was out there before sunrise and it was really cold, even though it was Spain. 
and these wa this water, and it was just such a memory, such an experience that um, it was more important. It was worth the money to to get it back. So um, yeah, here's me painting it. Um, so this is kind of one I've wanted to revisit ever since six years later. So I uh, I'm going to be quickly kind of doing some demo of this. And it's interesting that I had such a fun and vivid experience of painting with a palette knife and then basically never did it again <laughs> for the most part. But now painting with acrylics, I'm actually using a palette knife and some uh, different mediums that I can build up different textures. And um, so all of a sudden the palette knife is becoming a part of my life again, besides just using it to mix paintings or scrape off bad parts of paintings. Okay, so we have all these references. Painting examples. Uh, I asked uh, all of you to introduce yourselves in here, even though we just did that verbally. Um, and in that, I asked if you have any favorite artists or favorite paintings you would like to share, this is a great space to do that. It allows me to get to know you even that little bit better. For me to be the best teacher for you personally that I can be, I have to know your wants and desires. So if you said, you know what, I like, you know, Ovanis Barbarian, I like Calvin Liang, I love this painting. I also like, uh, you know, Jane Roos, and I, I love the softness of this. Then I can begin to go, okay, so you've got these, you know, conflicting issues, you've got this and that, and how do we bring that? I think it's one of the ways that we slowly develop our style as artists is by finding out who inspires us. And then almost it becomes like a hodgepodge or a mixture, right? We throw Ovanis, we throw Calvin, we throw Roos. We throw, you know, whatever favorite artists into, uh, I think it's actually pronounced Rose, um, but Roos, uh, into a pot. We stir them up. We mix in the ingredients that are us, our memories, our feelings, our emotions, our history, all those things. And that is partly how we create our own personal style. Um, and so I think it's really helpful and it's really inspiring. There's been a number of paintings that were shared. You can see again, there's just so many of them in here if we go all the way back. Um, so many different styles that were shared that it's opportunity for us to learn about artists that possibly we haven't learned about. And also a way for me to communicate and uh, learn more about you guys. All right, uh, instructor, that's me. Um, in this one, I did share this picture. I'm gonna go ahead and put it at the top because this is the picture I'll be working on this week doing a quick demo. If you want to paint along, you're more than welcome to use this as inspiration. But the idea for this week is using a tool, possibly the palette knife, brushes, whatever it is, to create a sense of texture and also creating hard edges and soft edges. Anybody writing this down so we can share what the homework is? It's just about getting a little bit liberated if you're just a brush person or if you're just a palette knife person, how do we combine these tools? How do we create hard edges and soft edges? So, you know, our rocks feel like rocks, hopefully and our water feels like water and our sky feels like sky. In fact, that's going to be a huge amount of the, what this class is about. So anyways, if you're curious, there's some of my paintings there. And then we get to your guys' section, and this is the most important section of it all. Above, you will see your name. It's alphabetical by first name. And I went ahead and kept everybody's work from past classes. I am going to ask for those of you who have been with me for a while, maybe have 50 pictures underneath here. If you could go through and delete 
everything but maybe your top 10. That will, again, alleviate kind of the bloat of the uh, Padlet page. So all you have to do is go to the three dots and to the bottom is delete post. Not saying delete this one, Diane Lewis. This is beautiful, even though you're not here. Um, but whichever ones you want, like different exercises, maybe that aren't as relevant. Um, and that will, again, we just need to free up a little bit of space to keep this page moving fluidly. Michael, I have tried to delete the previous uh, classes. I left my last painting on mine and I cannot delete previous classwork on my, on my page. Same here. Okay. I, I think we're all having that problem. I actually um, got it to work. And what I did was click on the image and then the image popped up on the screen as a sole thing like that. And then in the um, top right hand corner, there are three dots. And those three dots allowed me to delete the image, which Thank deleted you. the entire post. Because I was having the same problem. And Good. What, I, what I did realize too, and I hopefully fixed, is that uh, some of you had limited permissions. Some of you were post only. Some of you were moderators. And I, I hope, I hope, that I've set everybody as a moderator, meaning that you can move pictures around and that you can delete images and that you can do a lot more stuff on the Padlet page. Let me know if between what I just said and what Gail just said, if you're still having issues, let me know and I'll see if I can't figure that out. Um, but yeah, there's permissions that I have to grant to everybody. And even this morning, I sent out a couple more permissions, realizing that some people had been missed or there was a couple of students that had joined a little more recently and I hadn't gotten to. OK, I'll try what uh, Gail said. and I'll, yeah, I'll That worked it. for me this morning. I deleted a lot of stuff. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. So, yeah. And let's just use uh, Cheryl here. So if I have a painting that I want to share or any comments, you just simply push the plus button. Um, for any images, I don't go to the camera usually. I just use this upload a file, especially if it's from my computer. Um, and that works really well. The other thing is if I want to uh, share it like the uh, YouTube videos, let me just find a quick YouTube video um, that I'd like to share. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. <laughs> They're all movie reviews that are popping up on my YouTube right now. All right, here we go. Last art of play. I'm going to pause that. I have to skip. No. Anyways, what I would do is simply take the uh, link from the top of the screen, copy that, and put it here into the subject and the video will start to load. Let me see if I can just mute this YouTube video and get past the commercials because it doesn't work while commercials are playing. It'll take you to the commercial. All right, there we go. So I just copied something called the value of play or something like that. The um, basically the URL or the little code that's at the top of the screen. I push control C. Now I'm going to push control V. So control C means control copy. Control V means I don't know what it means. And you can see the counter like as it's loading. It's really fast. There we go. The lost art of play. I can push publish. And there you go. So now that's loaded up there. I have no idea what this video is. I didn't, you know, pick it specifically, but it's really a simple system. If I was, or if I am Diane Lewis, and I accidentally posted it to Cheryl Peters, I can simply push my left key on my mouse, grab this, and move it over to my section. Or if I'm Diane Lewis, again, and I put it on mine, but I, you know what, I should share it over here. To online links. And you see the little purple bar that appears? Like I could put it there, I could put it there in between the little spaces, probably too small for you guys to see on your screen. But I can just then release the key and it drops there. 
So Padlet is really easy to move around. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that post because I have no idea what it's about. Um, the other thing is if I am Cheryl Peters, and this is my top picture, but you know what? In this class, I want you to talk about this beautiful picture of the window and its shadows. I can just drag it and put it to the top of my screen. Oops, drag it and put it to the top of my screen. And now that is the top picture. So Padlet is really easy to manipulate and move around. You might want to put Diane's picture back on her under her name. I was just going to say that. You, you left Diane's oak tree under Cheryl's. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. We should have seen if she noticed. Um, so yeah, there we go. If um, I tried to find any of your guys' introductions and move them up so uh, you know students who had already done that didn't have to repeat themselves. Um, but if I didn't find yours, or anything else, you can just do that if you'd like to. Not too important since we had that couple minutes to introduce ourselves earlier. But anyways, this is where when we've uh, had some time to actually make a painting, we'll come through, we'll look, we'll, uh, I'll give feedback to each other. This is also a great space to describe your painting or talk about your thoughts and feelings or what you were working on. Maybe even ask a question of does, you know, this gray sky work or should I introduce some color or whatever else you want. And then underneath is commenting. It's so nice and simple. And uh, you just go into the add a comment and you can type whatever you'd like. And this is our way of staying in touch with each other the six days that we're not hanging out, because I know that's way too long to not talk and hang out and talk about art. So this is a great opportunity to go through. I really, really appreciate it when you go through and uh, give each other feedback, um, give each, you know, build each other up, all of that. Um, so anyways, that was the very, very condensed and consolidated version of Padlet. Does anybody have questions? Did the link work for everybody? We are muted. I think everybody got me, muted. It took me a long time to get there. You know that, Michael. But yeah. I, I, it is very simple. Uh, it's good. So far, so... Yeah, I used to do it on Facebook pages, and Facebook has its algorithm, so it would like mm. paintings up and put the most popular at the top, or you know, all these weird things. So it was really difficult to actually see each other's work. I've uh, I've so far found this to be the best way to uh, again communicate for me to share the handouts, the videos, everything else. Um, let me know. If you're struggling with any of it, um, again, I hope that me uh, giving everybody uh, more powerful permissions will allow you to do more. Um, yeah. Great. Any questions before I pop over? What we're going to do is we're going to look at this image, which is uh, very, very, very green. <laughs> And uh, very interesting. This is a photo I actually remember taking probably 10 years ago. I think it was when I, well, probably a little longer than 10 years ago, when I first got my iPhone and it had that high chroma setting that you could take photos. And I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then, you know, here we are all these years later and realizing all these photos are kind of feel useless because that green is toxic. I mean, it is just so vibrant and you know not a green i would want in my house this strong uh, it makes kermit the frog cry it makes irish people sad it's just so green um so Michael, what you should be able to go back and adjust that on your phone yeah but it's not on my phone that was like five phones ago oh, okay <laughs> but anyways i did find the photo and I thought it was kind of interesting because it has rocks, it has water, it has a couple of different things. But anyways, I'm just going to use it as a quick example of going through the first of our five stages. Again, design, 
draw, lock in, refine, and finish. So just quickly, if I saw this and I was like, yes, I would like to paint this. This would be an interesting painting. What do I do? I would take the image. I'm, I've already loaded it into Photoshop. So does everybody see my Photoshop? Okay. I know that very many of you do not have Photoshop. You can do all of this, you know, with pencil and paper. You can do thumbnails and everything else. But the great news or great thing with uh, Photoshop is it allows me to kind of give you a quick demonstration of what I would do. All right. Let's go ahead and unmute those of you who want to uh, have a conversation about this. Do you guys like this picture? Like, do you see something interesting that maybe would make an interesting photo? Photo? Sorry. I like, the, re I like the reflection. That's right? just what I was going to say, yeah. I like the path. I like the reflection in the path. I don't really like that big green blob on the left, but this really looks like a springtime green and greens right. are bright in the spring. They can be, they can be awfully bright. Yep. I, I would get rid of the whole left-hand side of the photo. It there seems you go. I would too. I, the I love majority, the contrast, but... the bright sky versus the dark, like shadowy area. Mm -hmm. I like the light. Yeah, like coming through the trees, it's beautiful. Yeah, so my favorite part would be this bottom quadrant. I find it interesting. I love the transparency of the water where there's the reflections. Um, I like the light. You know, I, I'm a big, big fan of dappled light, even though it's very difficult to paint plain air because it moves so very quickly. Um I find there's a lot of interesting things here and whether or not I would actually paint this, I don't know, but I just thought this was an interesting image. So the first thing I don't like is the green. It's a beautiful green for something, maybe, uh, I don't know what, I wouldn't like that green. So I would probably just go to adjust it and um, probably do go to the vibrance and anything, but I could do, again, I can do this mentally, right? but I'm just gonna pull that vibrance down and knock those greens down already better. I can knock the saturation down a little bit. Ugh, I can breathe, just feels less toxic. Slimer, the ghost is gone over here. Um, and it just already feels better. Okay, so now what I always ask when I'm looking at a painting is what drew me in. If you wanna write some notes down, it is what, you know, you guys can all associate with this. When we're driving down the roads, you preferably when you're a passenger and not the driver, but you see something so beautiful, you just have to pull out your camera or your phone and yep. snap a shot, right? Yep. So the first question when you get back to that probably blurry photo is what was it? You know, was it the colors? Was it the, what was it about that scene that made me pull out my camera? right? For me, it's probably the light in the shadow. It's also the, I love, again, I love the transparency leading out to this. Um, so what could I edit? What could I, you know, what do I need to preserve? What is the, if we break a painting down into like a hundred percent of a painting, right? A hundred percent of this painting or photo is not good. What is the top 20%? What is the most, like if I only had 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, if I'm Michelle, to paint this picture, what, am, what do I need to capture, right? Like, let's just say that you're there with your family and you need to pack up and leave shortly. What is the information I need to capture with my paints, right? That can be completely different. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. For some of you, it might be the bridge. Some of you it might be the dappled light. Some of you, it might be the, you know, the transparency and reflection, whatever it is. For me, I'm trying to remember back to, you know, all these years ago that I took this photo. Or I can just start afresh and just think, okay, I've seen this photo. It's got something, but it's a mess right? The green was the main mess for me. I hated that green. I've gotten rid of that to a degree. What parts do I like? I like this quadrant, right? 
So I probably want to preserve that. The next question I want to ask is, what don't I like? I hate this pine tree that I can't hardly see up here, just poking down a sharp, weird shape. It just draws attention into this corner and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? And I'm not even sure I like this bridge. Yeah, I wouldn't do the bridge. Right, or I was contemplating, what if I put it as an arched bridge with an arched thing here, then I'd have a circle that maybe I could bring back in, right? You know, there's some circular shapes in here. Maybe that would be kind of a cool design. So I'm going to put that one on the back burner, right? Maybe as an arched bridge, but I don't like that it cuts off the trees behind it. Um, I don't like the white of the sky, right? When you take a photo, especially, you know, 10 years ago when the iPhone wasn't as good, to get all the information in the shadows, it's going to bleach out my sky, right? And it maybe it was an overcast, slightly overcast day, so it was a gray sky. But I don't like this color much. So I'm kind of writing these notes down or I'm putting them into my thought process as I move forward with my picture. Um, with Photoshop, I can do some simple fixes. I can, you know, I can simply get rid of things. If I push the right keys, <laughs> right, I can just get rid of that tree. Just like, yeah, that's that's better. It's already better. It already mm -hmm. feels. If I've gotten rid of it down here, do I need to get rid of it up here? Maybe. Oops. Not if you're cropping it. Not if I'm cropping it. So yeah, that's a great point. Maybe mm -hmm. I should crop first. Um, yeah, so let's think cropping. So I'm going to grab my little lasso tool here and I set it to square. I could use it as a, you know, soft round, but that doesn't really work. <clears throat> this is my focus. You know, can I crop in this much? I can also move this once I'm here. You know, that puts this area up towards the top. A lot of times, too, I like to think, well, what if I literally zoomed way in? All right, let's just do. That's actually a little more interesting already. I'd get rid of that bridge because it just leads me out. Go ahead. That's better. It is already better, right? It's a nice diagonal across the... Um shoreline yeah exactly but if that's what i'm interested in but i really like this information what if i didn't go horizontally but what if i went vertically i don't want to pick on anybody in the class by any means or let's just go full vertical let's just yeah right yeah that's better Oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah, that's I like that. Yeah. your heart rate go down? Yeah. yeah. The full picture to me seemed out of balance with the tree on the left and right. so much on the right. It just was, I don't know, it was off to me. There was too much on the right and not enough on the left, I guess. That's the way I see it. It's odd. But no, the, you're, you're the right. one tree seems like it's almost right in the middle. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, exactly. It so, feels yeah. like all of the lines are like, yeah, coming towards that um, that area. Right in the middle. Dead center. Middle, yeah. So yeah, so we can think about that. So already, so what's funny is maybe when I took this picture, I was thinking like, oh, that bridge is interesting or, you know, these trees or the reflection. <laughs> Um, but you just don't know. So that's why we want to experiment. What if I brought it down and, but over, you can do, oops, I don't know what I just did. Um, you can do all of this by just doing a printout of the whole picture and then laying pieces of paper across the top oh. of it. Oh, cool. Um, what I do, and I think Gail, you mentioned this too, is I've got two piece, big L pieces of paper that I cut out mm -hmm. and I'll just zoom in and zoom out by just taking those two L's. Yep, Donna's doing it with her hands there. By mm -hmm. uh, 
just bringing them in and out. And if you guys need an example of that, we'll do that, um, you know, a visual uh, demonstration. I'll do that in a future class. So let's just go image and let's just crop this and see. Uh, that feels a little weird for one. It comes right into the corner and almost into the corner. It's interesting and it's creative, but it just doesn't feel good to me. And again, this is all, you know, you guys, one of you could be, just, yep, wow, I'm painting that. That's fantastic. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, so that's, that is basically the design stage. A lot of times I'll do thumbnail sketches, especially if I'm out plein air painting. Uh, thumbnail sketches are oftentimes just black and white. So okay. another thing I like to do often and almost anytime you see me have printouts in my studio of a picture I plan to paint, I will actually have, and Hassan, here's your biggest first hint on how to be a tonalist painter. It's paint from black and white photos. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's just go to desaturate image adjustments. Right now, all of a sudden, I can turn this into a fall painting. I can turn it into not a winter painting since it's got all the leaves. You know, I've got to keep the structure intact, probably, unless I'm really willing to make up a lot of stuff. Um, so there's a lot there. But what I want to look for in this is literally the lights and the darks, which is what's so great about black and white or grayscale painting. And I want to see, does my eye move along the darks in some kind of an interesting way? Can I link darks? Can I link the lights? Or is it super spotty and broken and really hard to bind back up? Our eye follows likes, like values, like colors, like edges. Our eye follows contrast. You see how this line here on the beach, our eye will follow that. See the line in the dark? Mm -hmm. It will follow that. Our eye is attracted towards contrast, lights and darks, hard edge and soft edge, uh, cool colors, warm colors. All of these things are tools that we get to use in our paintings to guide the viewer. So in this case, we're just looking at the values, the lights and the darks. And how does that work? Does it help lead the eye around? If it doesn't, but it could, then I can change it, right? Like you see the straight line of the lights across here of the land in the background? If mm -hmm. I have the eye travel up and keep the shadows going, I could increase a bit of an angle or something there. So I'm thinking about all of these things. We're mm -hmm. going to be talking about this in future classes. A painting well begun is half done. Mm -hmm. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. A painting poorly begun and jumps in is, a free, is no fun. There we go. There's the rhyme. Mm -hmm. I was going to say. It's horrible, but yeah, it's no fun because what you're going to be doing is trying to fix. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't have all my mottos written down and made into t-shirts and beer koozies already, is <laughs> painting is fun, fixing is not. And I swear to you, five, 10, 15 extra minutes and figuring out your design and working on that in the beginning can save you hours, days, and weeks of fixing later if you get a painting that's far along and then you realize there's issues. Removing things, once you've already got all the colors in and all the values and all the leaves or whatever, however detailed you wanna get your image, and then just going, oh no, this weird tangent or oh, this weird thing or the fact that this line here leads right into the corner, I've got to fix that, means remixing all those colors, covering beautiful areas of paint. It is a heartache. So it is worth spending 
extra time. The piles of paintings that I have over to the right of me right now, which is probably like 20, are paintings I jumped in half cocked. I just was like so excited, so infatuated by some aspect of it, if it was the color or the subject or anything else, but I did not refine and define the design. So does that make sense to you guys? So if I, if I said everybody, you know, I want you to either do some thumbnails or some design work on this, you would all come out with different things. There's no, I mean, there's a good chance some of you might be like this, you know what? I love this. This is really interesting, especially if I arched the bridge. There's a beauty in here. But the problem for me is that I found beauty here. I found beauty here. I found interesting things here. I found some hideous areas, you know, like this weird branch kind of doing the peekaboo over here as it, you know, peeks its head in for, you know, getting in. I actually like that. I actually like how it keeps the shapes going, but I'm not positive it would work if I crop, because what I like is that it has this kind of circular motion a little bit. But it, when I crop out these other elements that are maybe less successful, I have to decide, does that branch still serve a purpose or is it just, I kind of like it though. Um, but then maybe I need to introduce a contrasting line to keep the eye moving. But then we have these reflections over here that are almost like contrasting lines. So there's some interesting things going on in here. Um, I would spend more time than I'm doing right now thinking about all these things. Do you guys want part of your homework to figure out two to three different designs on this picture? I can email it to you guys and then we can think about painting it in future classes. Is this an image that you guys think would be uh, interesting enough? Yeah. Yes. In all of its hideousness? I don't think it's hideous. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but it has a lot of potential. That's what I mean. Look at that. That's just. You know what I mean? That that's toxic looking to me. Again, color is relative. I agree. It's gonna be like bright green, my favorite color. My whole house is fluorescent. <laughs> um, I'd have a hard time staying for very long. But you know what I mean? It's all relative. I can't tell you you should not paint this green because that's your thing. You know, we all love different colors. Um, I love, you know, muted colors, I love umbers, I love, you know. All these different colors but um so that's personal i can't tell you what's right what's wrong when it comes to color i can't even tell you what's right or wrong about design but i can say that this is how i deal with this image right just going through all the different edits that's that I did and thinking about it I, I think there's something interesting here. I'd like to almost see that in color. Not that color. <laughs> what? Did, where's my color? There we go. Something like this, something like that. I think a little higher. I kind of liked it with almost a high. Um, and I can decide. Having things lead right into the corner. Let me crop it so we can see it. Having things lead right into the corner is generally considered bad in painting. It can work in photos a little more successfully. It's kind of um, preached or taught that this leads the eye out of the scene. And I think that's often the case, but sometimes it's actually a nice lead in and like lieu of having a trail or a path or anything. It's kind of can be a nice lead in line. What I also want to think about is what size canvas am I painting? Is it going to be a 16 inch by 20 inch? And sorry, Hassan, we talk in inches in this. Oh, no, you're British. You're inches too, right? All right. We're all in the same weird world. Um, <laughs> uh, Good. <laughs> we yeah. use both centimeter and inches. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So yeah, like the common sizes, at least here in the US is like, uh, you know, for a small size would be like an eight inch by 10 inch or a nine by 12 inch. So they have different, you know, a four inch by, you know, it's a four by five or a three by four. So I wanna figure out, you know, what size canvas I want to do this on, or I can do my editing and then go out and buy the canvas to find a correlating space. 
What I do find with so many students is they'll find like, oh, I really like um, this design, right? Which is very much a square, right? But they won't buy a square canvas. They'll buy a 16 inch by 20 inch canvas, mm -hmm. which is a three, three by four format. Mm -hmm. They haven't figured it out like, oh, I need to edit it more or I need to add back in either high top, bottom or one of the sides to make it fit. So make sure if you have a limited amount of canvases, like you're going to paint on an eight inch by 10 inch or a nine inch by 12 inch or whatever size, figure out what that proportion is. And when you're doing your editing, be aware of that. So if you had a square canvas, you know, this could be a good edit. In fact, maybe this is one of my favorite edits so far. I don't like this tangent right here that this triangle is touching right on the edge, but that's easy enough. I just bring my rock out a little further, right? Um, would, that, would that fit on a four by four or an eight by eight or a 12 by 12? Yes, <clears throat> exactly. Anything like that, a 36 by 36, 48 by 48, 50, yeah, any, any square format it'll fit on. So a three by four will fit on a six by eight, a, you know, on and on it goes, 12 by 16. Um, I don't know if that was good math there. Uh, 16 by 20, um, any of those formats. So you just kind of want to figure that out. I, I can't tell you how many times, or even worse, what happens a lot of times with students is um, they'll do like this, which is a horizontal, right? It's taller than it is wide. And I won't have come vertical. around. A vertical, yeah, vertical, sorry. Taller than it is wide. And then I'll come around and they'll have their canvas set horizontally, but they'll be have their reference set this way. So those are just quick and easy mistakes that we all make that can be easily avoided. So you just want to take that extra second to just think about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me think about if I want this to be a part of the homework. Because it's a strange image. Do you guys like this? Something that you might be interested to paint in a future class? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's Great. challenging. <laughs> a lot yeah, of detail. So that's that's a good part of it, is how do we simplify it? Like mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is if I'm more of a tonalist in, you know, maybe bright greens, even now that we've isolated, it's still quite green. So I can come through and I can do that again mentally and I can just do color balance and I'm just going to drop my greens down, lean towards the reds, maybe a little bit, um, maybe. And you can do these in your phone with different apps. Hmm. So yeah, so there I oh, you know what? I mean, that could be a kind of a cool tonalist painting. It's just a green tonalist painting, which you don't see very often. But there are a couple beautiful ones. Um, so I'm just gonna cancel that. And so you can do all sorts of color editing. Again, you can do it mentally. I could just be like, you know what? Um, I want it, I'm just gonna even desaturate it more. Oh, not that much. Um one of the things that I have a lot of trouble with is the reflections in water. Yeah, and we we will definitely be talking about that um, more and more hue saturation. That's the one I was looking for. So I'm just going to take my saturation down a little more. So it's a little bit green. I can lighten it up a little bit if I want to see more information in the shadows. This big dark rock shape back here, it's a little heavy. But if I lighten everything up, you know, that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, you know, I'll take it all the way to dark. I can make it more moody. All these things. So we are not beholden to our photo. Again, it's a jumping off mental, a uh, jumping off place mentally. We can mm -hmm. go where if we want. Again, this tree is kind of centered. We got this line going up and down. I can move it one way or the other. A little bit might help. Maybe this weird, awkward branch that has this weird fat shape right here. You know, I don't know if that's that logical. I don't know, you know, what happened there. 
I may, you know, make it a little more normal. I could bring another branch off. All sorts of things we can do as we're looking at our references. Michael, so, what if we, you took what if you took out those two little green blobs of trees that's just sprouting back here four or five feet and take this one with the branches, the big two split tree, put it where those trees are and turn it over. Like make the leaning end branch toward the middle and the straight one on the back side, so it would stop the eye and and not let you run off the page and you'd see something light and come back around. So you're saying move this tree to roughly here? Mm -hmm. No, the side one. The one yeah, the and yeah, take the one. side, take the ones behind the right here in that wherever growing. Take that out. Take those two little things out. You'd get more backlight and you'd have more light in the area. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. so many things we can do. So what, as we are going forward in the class, and this will be a lot, covered a lot more in the fall class, because that's going to be a lot more about design. I want you to figure out, and again, if you're writing notes, what is the 20% that I love? What inspired me? What brought me to this? And it can be color. It can be light. It can be the light and shadow. It can be the subject, whatever it is. But what's that 20%? And then with the rest of the 80%, question all of it, right? Like, I don't know if this tree is helpful. I don't know. You know, I got rid of a huge amount of the picture. Think of all of it. And doesn't mean always just deleting it. Sometimes it just means making it less important by softening its edges or making its value contrast a little less. So what is the story or the thing or the subject or what's the prima donna, right? I bring that up in class all the time. What's the thing that this painting is about? How do I make everything else support the prima donna or a background character that's helping tell the story? How do I emphasize and how do I de-emphasize very, very important. So what I guess I'm telling you is if you have a photo that has something in it, investigate it. What is it that I like? What don't I like? What can I change easily? What, you know, you know, the most important thing that stays the same. And that will really help us as we're moving forward in our painting. Cool. Yes. All right. We will go over this so i'm going to save this homework for next week but we'll or mm, no actually so what are we going to work on this week uh making you can decide at the end of class yeah let's let's talk about that all right so I'm gonna shut this down get back to our padlet um so what i was intending to do this week but again i even thought about like oh am i jumping too far forward was doing this a little bit larger. That's what I've got on the palette kind of started and just showing a little bit about um, a, using a hard edge, soft edge on a, um, on uh, for rocks and water, creating kind of that alternate texture and edge work. Would we, I'm wondering if I should reverse it and do the other painting first. And then coming back next week, we can use some of this information for that painting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Hassan. Sorry, all my other new students. This is kind of how I <laughs> sometimes work. Yeah, I was so excited to have made that handout for the uh, textural perspective that I wanted to share it. And then I'm like, but wait, I haven't showed all the other stuff that leads into actually making a painting. Um, this will take a lot of, you know, could take some... <laughs> more than more than one week of practice so i mean i think personally this looks interesting mm -hmm. all right so yeah um so yes maybe jump to this as the demo for today yes okay and then we will as a group figure out our homework and uh, for anybody that needs to jump off before the actual end of class um, I will email that to everybody, what, what we ended up deciding for homework. Um, anybody else have strong opinions one way or the other there? What would you demo if it wasn't this? Uh, doing that other painting. 
like figuring out that design and showing you how I would draw and block it in. And then probably next week coming back in and refining it um, and finishing it. Michael, I have a question regarding that. Um, if we're going to play with that all today, it seems redundant to go back and play just ourselves. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just saying if that's going to be our homework, we kind of already did that. The design part, you mean? Yeah. No, because we haven't done it individually. Well, that's true, but okay. Yeah, so there's incorporate design into this one as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So you Let's... will email that picture to us, right? This one here? Yeah. Yep, it was in the email to the class, yep. Okay. So yeah, this the is- The air. painting or the reference photo? I don't really have a reference photo because it was plain air. The closest oh. reference photo I could find that I actually caught was this one. And again, so if what we I, have a reference photo that kind of goes along with that, that'd be fine too. Yeah, exactly. So you have that. And then I grabbed, because um, I don't love those black rocks. I just find them a little boring. You can see I added some color, but I probably want a little more. Um, so what I did was I grabbed, oh gosh, yeah. So what I did was I grabbed some examples of different paintings with rocks that I actually prefer the colors to. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, that's what happens. I just end up combining all these different ideas, all these different thoughts. I don't know why it jumps back to here every time. Um, yeah, so all these different information. So let's really quickly talk about um, the idea of textural perspective and brushwork in painting really fast. We're just going to go through these. So I grabbed a whole bunch of different references of water and uh, waves and different textures. So this is Ovanus Barbarian. He was one of my early instructors. Well, I took some workshops from him. He's there. He loves keeping the brush strokes very solid. You know, you can almost see every individual brush stroke to a degree. Um, I love the energy and the focus in that. Um, geez, why does it want to go to right to the middle of the padlet? That's going to be annoying if I can't just jump back. Um, and then we've got different implied texture, but you can tell that this isn't really, really thick or the whole painting is kind of equally thick treated. So what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, textural perspective is actually oftentimes having either thicker paint up front or thicker paint in the focus area. Um, oof, it's going to make me sad. I have to do this every time. So there's a lot of different examples. These are all kind of equally treated paintings. And then they're going to steadily get a little looser and a little thicker in paint by different artists. Um, and then we get up to here and all of a sudden we start getting some palette knife painting. What I like and don't like about palette knife paintings is I like the texture. I like the information, but when it's all treated the same, personally, I find it flattens out. And mm -hmm. I, my favorite paintings that use palette knives also use brushes, have soft edges, have hard edges. The great thing about a palette knife is that it, easily and obviously creates these nice hard lines, right? It's a beautiful painting. It's got a lot of energy, a lot of texture and stuff, but not what I personally would like to do. So I love the combination of hard edge, soft edge. When we're thinking about like a cloud, versus a rock, right? Often that differentiation is in their edge quality, right? A, a cloud will have a softer edge, whereas a rock will have a harder edge. So you can see these clouds with these nice soft edges, mm -hmm. these rocks with nice, crisp, hard edges. 
if you aren't, you know, wanting to use a palette knife or you don't want to use a palette knife too much, you can use a softer, more organic brush up here. And then you might want to use a flat, you know, the brushes that are literally a square shape that has a clean line. I've been doing a lot of crashing waves on rocks paintings lately. And I'm really finding I'm using a huge diversity of paintbrushes, right? I've got my stippling with the horrible brush. I've got soft edges in the clouds. And then in the rocks, I'm using a more squared off brush that I'm not making the same mark over and over. I'm, you know, using its edge. I'm turning it. I'm loading different lights and darks. So you guys hopefully can really see that the water has a personality, the rocks have a personality, and the clouds, very soft edge, can barely even tell where they start and where they finish. <laughs> um, let's see if I have other examples of, nope. I haven't loaded them in yet. Um, but yeah, this is the newest one I've been working on where, you know, the clouds Beautiful. are ultimately soft. Beautiful. The water is soft where it's exploding, gets harder where it's a little firmer. And then we get into the rocks and hopefully they feel solid, even though there's a lot of atmosphere back here on these, you can still see a fairly clearly delineated mm -hmm edge that I do lose in areas because I'm wanting to create the idea of mist, fog, atmosphere. This is one knife for those uh, far away rocks. What's or that? Did you use like palette knife for the farthest away rocks or is it brush? I actually used a brush in almost all of this. Right. I don't really use a palette knife very often. But Palette knife is a great way to uh, show, you know, I, I, I love flat brushes, you know, where I can create a nice clean edge and then I'll use old beat up brushes or softer brushes or other things where I want to, or I'll just brush over it until the edge disappears, you know, just softening those transitions. So there's lots of tools we have to create different edge quality. Um, so yeah, I don't think I used a palette knife at all in this. I do have uh, a wave painting that's in the studio. Maybe I can hold it up in front of the camera or let's just see if I can add it. I'll just add it here real quick. Let me grab it for my pictures. Since I just got a professional photographer to take the photo for me. So let's see if we can see the uh, texture in this painting. So here I use the palette knife to load up the waves. So in the in reality, there's quite a lot of texture here. I didn't use it. I used a brush and more organic to build up some of this uh, grass and things like that. But you can actually see the broken texture a little bit back here as I built up layers of paint. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. used the path in my waves and my water by so I could apply it thickly. And then where I wanted to, I could soften edges can also, uh, after it dried, come back and dry brush over the top of it. We'll see if it maybe shows up better in the real paintings. I actually have it here in the studio, so I haven't sent it to the gallery yet. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can use a palette knife to create edges, to apply paint really thick. Um, what I was kind of doing is dragging the brush or the, the palette knife across so it gets this kind of like where it's just kind of skipping across the textures. And it really made some interesting things happen. I don't know. Should we jump up and experiment on the pal on the easel and see how it goes? Yes. 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 Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah. 
So we're going to take one more, this time a very short break as I step up there and get my tools ready. And uh, so part three of class is painting demo. Um, yeah, and I want you guys to be thinking about, um, we can be using this textural, uh, uh, textural perspective throughout the entire class for those of you who are interested in it. Um, I just wanted you to be aware of it. It's not something I use very often in my paintings. My paintings are oftentimes very thin. Um, my thinking is in response to AI art, how this whole idea has come to be is with AI art, it's so easy to make these beautiful images. How do I compete, right? Well, texture is a big thing that a painter can do and present and the physical painting that's um, still hard for you know AI or for printers or whatever else, they'll catch up. The other thing that um, I can do is uh, layers of transparency, which is another painting that I shared with you guys in the last class, where I did nine layers of transparent color to create this painting. Right, so what are different things? So this painting was done, I put two clear layers, painted a little bit, another clear layer, let it dry, paint a little bit, and then really built it up slowly into nine different layers of transparent paint. So it maybe doesn't show on the monitor, but when you see this painting physically, the light's really getting in and bouncing around uh, strategically uh, Maxfield Parrish, uh, maybe some of you have heard of him, old American painter, was one of my very favorite first painters. So always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about, you know, how did he do what he did? Um, finally learned that he was actually putting transparent layers and letting them dry, literally transparent layers of paint in between his paints. I wasn't patient enough to try that experiment with oil, so this was done uh, seven layers with acrylic and then letting it dry for two days or what I call cure because paints, uh, acrylics will dry in about 15 to 20 minutes, but I want to make sure that it's, you know, getting all the moisture out of it. So I let it cure. And then I came across with two transparent layers of oil paint to harmonize the entire piece and to get it to uh, kind of lock in. So those are, oh, and I also did the textural thing with the acrylic paints so that the wavelets back in the background are actually going to be affected. If the light's overhead, the water will look different than if the light's in front of it, whether the light's beside it. Um, so it has a whole lot of different things that I thought, okay, this makes owning a physical object made by a human different, right? Something that computers are not quite doing yet. Um, so anyways, People are scared of AI. AI is terrifying and, and amazing, beautiful in what it can do. But how do we make it more human? How do we make the paintings more painterly? How do we make the you know, different effects that paints can do so well uh, meaningful? So those are things I'm just leaning into. So instead of saying, I'm scared of AI, I give up. I'm saying, okay, thanks for the challenge, AI. I see you. What are ways I can push myself to do things differently or explore some avenues that maybe I haven't been exploring, um, different things like that. So there we go. Mike, Our, what was the clear um what 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 was the clear product that you used in between those? I mixed um, airbrush medium and matte medium together for no reason besides those are the two mediums I have. I don't have that much acrylic supplies uh, yet because I'm, acrylics are still pretty new to me. Um, but I did the first, uh, what, let me see if I can pull it up, if I can find it. Um, oh, I can just pop over to my Facebook page. I actually showed a bunch of this stuff in step-by-step. Step. Got a couple posts back. So there's the final image. <laughs> Sorry, it's a couple of posts back, evidently. I think it's here. So this would be uh, when I took the photo before I had a professional photograph it. And then I thought I put into the comments, I thought I put um, the different stages.
<laughs> huh. All right. Well, this is the fast forward through this part when you rewatch. Is it under your see more there where at the very top? Well, here's the first stage. So this has got, um, or maybe the fourth stage. So you can see that it was just kind of a um, very tonal, just kind of getting my design, getting my values established. I don't think I posted into there. Yeah, I thought it was in this section. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, so first stage. And then it's the final stage. Ah, here we go. So there you can see, then it all of a sudden got pretty colorful. So that's again, I'm still just using acrylic paints, but I introduced blue, reds, and greens. And then the final one where I just went over it with warm wash. And it kind of harmonized. So it still hints at some of the greens, some of the blues and the reds but everything is in the same color value or color family, if that makes sense. So you can kind of see it a little more greenish, a little more greenish, a little more bluish, a little more reddish. Which color did you use for the wash? Is it like a single color, like multiple color for the wash? Quinacridone gold. But I uh, typically would probably use like a Indian yellow, but then it would have been even more bright yellow and more uh, a little harder to control. But anyways, yeah, I just looked on the back for uh, transparent colors on the backs of the tubes. All right, let's take a five minute break. I feel like I need to regain my thoughts, <laughs> recollect my thoughts here. Uh, but anyways, thank you guys. And um, we'll be right back and let's do a little painting demo here. Great. Great. And I'll be checking out round three again. Round three. Okay. Look for it in the recordings. Here we go. <laughs> 